So, for the past month and a half or so, I have been hopelessly addicted to Monster Hunter World. As you can see, I've already amassed nearly 300 hours on my character, and I've killed pretty much every single monster in the game, outside of a couple limited time and collab monsters. In this video, I basically just want to talk about my experience going through Monster Hunter World and its expansion Iceborne. I'll be talking about some of my favorite monsters that I encountered along the way, and overall all the different things that the game did right to get me hooked, because goddamn, this game is fantastic. Alright, so first of all, before we get into World, I thought I'd give a brief overview of my own experience with the Monster Hunter franchise since this isn't actually my first Monster Hunter game. My very first experience with the Monster Hunter franchise was actually Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate on the 3DS. I had only played the demo for this when I was a very young kid, and I was way too dumb to understand what the hell was even happening. I think I got completely lost looking for the monster, and then whenever I did find it, I would just die to it, and I had no idea what was happening, so it was a very long time until I ever gave the series a chance after this. It wasn't until the initial PC release of Monster Hunter World, actually, that I tried the franchise out again. This time, I played for about 10 hours, but ultimately, I still dropped the game because I found the combat felt pretty clunky, and I was just more interested in other games at the time as well. It wasn't until 2022, with the release of Monster Hunter Rise on PC, that I finally clicked with this franchise, and I think a lot of that comes from actually playing Rise with a friend who was already experienced with the game, he was able to teach me things very quickly, and I actually finally understood the flow of a Monster Hunter game. It clicked, and I absolutely loved it. I have like 300 hours on Monster Hunter Rise. Additionally, I've also played around 100 hours of Generations Ultimate on the Switch, but this was a pretty recent thing. Like, right before I got into Monster Hunter World, I was playing Generations Ultimate pretty heavy. So anyway, there you go. That's my kind of history with the franchise. I'm no Monster Hunter veteran. I haven't been playing this series for 10 years or some shit like that. But I did play Rise, uh, and I did play some Generations Ultimate. So I have some experience with this franchise. I was not a brand new player coming into Monster Hunter World. So that catches us up to around two months ago now when Monster Hunter Wilds first got announced. This generated tons of hype around World again, as we all know, and so my friend eventually convinced me to go ahead and grab Iceborne so I could give World a proper shot again. Especially now that I was already familiar with how Monster Hunter gameplay loop was supposed to work, you know, it would be a lot easier to get into World now than when I had first tried it. So at this point, I'm getting into Monster Hunter World. What's the first step we need to take? Well, the most important decision you need to make when you're first starting this game is picking your weapon of choice. Monster Hunter World has 14 completely unique weapon classes to choose from, all with their own distinct playstyles. You'll often hear people compare Monster Hunter weapons with fighting game characters, as the level of depth is actually quite similar. My personal weapon of choice is the Insect Glaive. I absolutely fell in love with this thing in Rise, but in World, it's a completely different beast, and I absolutely love it. The weapon's gameplay loop involves harvesting buffs with your little insect buddy in order to make both your glaive and your insect stronger. You've got three different colors of these buffs that all provide important enhancements to the weapon. The most important of these three colors is red, which essentially unlocks the insect glaive's actual moveset. Many of your attacks gain more hits, it opens up more combo routes, and you're just going to want to keep this active as much as you can because it is a massive increase to your damage. I pretty much instantly fell in love with this weapon the moment I tried it, I've now got 500 hunts with the damn thing, and I've barely used anything else in this entire game. The feeling of jumping over enemy attacks and landing that perfect downwards thrust straight through their head, it's seriously like nothing else, this is totally my type of weapon. Ultimately though, there is a ton of weapons to choose from in this game, they're all extremely unique, and there's absolutely going to be something for everyone. If you're getting into this game, I highly, highly recommend you try out every single weapon, you press some buttons with them, you just go in the training mode and see what you think of them, because the weapons are super sick in Monster Hunter, and I love how like every weapon in this game basically has its own cult following of people who just love that weapon and will gas it up with their lives. Before I get into some of my favorite monsters here now and experience on this game in general, I want to briefly explain the actual gameplay loop real quick for those of you who have never played a Monster Hunter game and you have no idea how these games are supposed to work. Thankfully, it's very simple to explain. You head out into the wild to hunt down monsters and you can either capture or kill them. Very self-explanatory. You can then use their parts to create armor and weapons that make you stronger so that you can go and hunt stronger monsters to make stronger weapons and armor. That is the core of the game. 
This game's canteen and food mechanic is also extremely important to hunting. You'll basically want to visit the canteen every time before you go on a hunt, because if you eat, it'll give a massive buff to your HP and stamina, among other various effects such as giving you an extra life in the case of feline insurance. I think one of the hardest barriers to overcome when you're initially getting into a Monster Hunter game like this for the first time is actually understanding the flow of the hunt. If you're anything like me, you may have given Monster Hunter a chance since you like Souls-like games and mastering a boss's moveset. While Monster Hunter absolutely does provide that feeling of mastery and learning, it also has a huge emphasis on using both your environments and your tools and items as a hunter to have more success within hunts. To give you a super basic example, let's take the Barrel Bombs for instance, one of the simplest items in the entire game. Essentially, you just place these down and you can smack them to blow up the monster and do pretty big damage. Something you'll notice though is that you don't just want to randomly start putting barrel bombs down in the middle of a fight. There's no way to really reliably hit a monster if it's moving around a lot, you're going to be blowing up your teammates if you're playing with other people, and overall, you know, you're not just trying to throw out barrel bombs randomly, that's not exactly the best way to deal damage. Now, this is where the monster's actual behavior comes into play. You see, during hunts in this game, when you've gotten a monster low enough, it will retreat from you and it'll go back to its nest so that it can try to sleep to regain its strength. During this time that it is sleeping is your ideal chance to use items such as barrel bombs. You know, you just go plant them right in front of the monster's face, blow them up, and boom, you just got free damage. You didn't, uh, like, annoy your teammates in any way, you know, you weren't blowing people up, and the barrel bombs were guaranteed to hit because, you know, the monster is stationary, it's asleep, it doesn't know you're there. I use this as an example purely because it's probably the very first instance of like learning to use items correctly outside of actually trapping a monster which is an extremely similar process. Instead of you know throwing barrel bombs at the monster while it's asleep, you're instead going to put it in a trap and you're going to throw trank bombs at it to capture it. You'll want to get very familiar with using traps because capturing monsters is extremely good in Monster Hunter World. It usually nets you more rare materials depending on the monster and it also shortens the overall time of the hunt since you don't need to fully kill the monster and the wait timer is only 20 seconds as opposed to 60 when you actually defeat the thing. There is also tons of other useful items you can bring to the hunt as well though. Flash pods to stun the monsters or to knock flying monsters out of the air. You can use dung pods to shoo away monsters that are getting in the way of your main target. The emphasis on using consumable items in Monster Hunter and coming to a hunt prepared is something really special and unique to this series of games. It does a good job at making you feel like you're actually hunting down this monster rather than just having a boss fight with it. Having brought you up to speed now on what Monster Hunter actually looks like and how the flow of the game is going to feel, let's talk about the base game of Monster Hunter World. In all honesty, the base game was a bit of a blur to me, it went by extremely quickly, and most of it was just me getting accustomed to the systems and figuring out how this game worked differently than Monster Hunter Rides. Now, I chose to use something called the Defender Gear, which if you play this game, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's basically an extremely broken catch-up gear set to get you to Iceborne as fast as humanly possible. You are basically unkillable in the base game while wearing this armor, so I highly recommend against using it if this is your very first Monster Hunter game, or if you don't own Iceborne, since you'll basically rob yourself of any sense of progression at all in the base game. I was personally fine with this since I've already played other Monster Hunter games and I was mainly just trying to catch up to my friends who were already in Iceborne, but I would be lying if I said it didn't affect my enjoyment of the base game. It definitely made some of the major climactic fights like Nergigante and Xenojiva feel a bit underwhelming. This is why if you're not in a mad rush to catch up to your friends who are already in Iceborne, for your own enjoyment of the game, I recommend just playing through it normally and not using this catch-up gear because you're just going to have a way better sense of progression and overall feeling while you're playing this game. Something about the base game I also found myself frustrated with was actually the main hub, Astera. Basically, to navigate this place, you have to constantly run back and forth between an elevator because all the different vendors you need to visit between hunts are on different floors of the actual hub. The shop and the botanical research are on one floor, the blacksmith is on another floor, and then the canteen is on a completely different floor. So you're going to be jumping between this elevator a lot during hunts. And you got to remember, I'm coming from Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak, which has one of the smallest and easiest to navigate hubs in the entire series with Elgato. I absolutely love that place and you know this is basically the opposite of that it's this super big 
you know, hub zone with a lot of verticality to it that's kind of annoying to navigate. And I find, especially if you're a brand new player trying to figure out where the hell you're supposed to be going between hunts, it can be really annoying to navigate this place. In reality, it's not that annoying, and you will get used to it, because ultimately, the hub is still a Monster Hunter hub. It's not this gigantic fucking area that you have to memorize. It's still pretty small, it's just that the verticality makes it way more annoying to navigate than any other hub I've ever been in. I'd be lying if I said I ever bothered to visit this place again after reaching the Iceborne hub. And while I'm on the topic of early game annoyances, I might as well mention the Scout Flies and something I call Monster Finder World Quests. If this is your first Monster Hunter game, it may not bother you as much as it bothered me, but coming from Monster Hunter Rise, this was something that took me a minute to get used to. Basically, in Rise, when you're hunting a monster, it is automatically displayed on your map the moment you get in the hunt. It's all about getting to that monster and fighting it immediately. In World, it doesn't work like that until you've leveled up and fought the monster enough times to make it show up on your map from your research level. If your monster isn't high enough level to show up on the map, then you need to go look for tracks and you need to follow those tracks to the monster. Now, if your monster has any research level at all, meaning you've fought it before or whatever, it's likely that your scout flies are just going to lead you straight to the tracks, and then once you start picking up the tracks, you're immediately just going to find the monster, and it's not a big deal. The problem is, when you're brand brand new to this game, you have no levels on your scout flies, you have no levels on any of these monsters, so when you're looking for them, in the very first map of the game, the Ancient Forest is a massive map with tons of verticality, it can be hard to even find a singular trace of that monster if you don't know where to look. This is where it became a joke among my friends and I to be like, yo yo yo, hop on Monster Finder World boys, it's time to run around in circles for 10 minutes looking for footprints. Thankfully though, this is something that stopped being an annoyance for me as soon as I hit the DLC. Uh, as soon as I hit Iceborne, I don't remember ever looking for a monster again. The game typically will just lead you straight to it, it'll spawn you on top of it sometimes, or it'll just lead you to the trail that you need to follow. Iceborne was so much better about this, I don't know why the base game was like so insistent on you running around in circles for 10 minutes. The main reason I even bring up this complaint is not to say all oh, the base game fucking sucks, but more so to say if you're new to this game and this is annoying you, don't worry, it annoyed me too and it probably annoyed a whole lot of us Monster Hunter players, but once you get far, far enough into the game, this stops completely and you won't have to look for tracks anymore. Anyways, enough talk about the base game as it's only a very, very small fraction of my playtime in all honesty, and because of the defender gear, it just, like, it was such a blur, I don't even really remember much of it. Iceborne is where the real game started for me, and right out of the gate, you'll notice that your defender gear is no longer anything special, and even the lowest rank monsters within master rank immediately reward massive improvements on your armor and your weapons. The new hub area in Iceborne, called Celiana, is a ginormous improvement over its base game counterpart. They decided to ditch the whole verticality level design and gave us a very nice simple to navigate hub with everything close by together. The gathering hub here is also a significant improvement as all the major vendors you need to speak with between hunts are also in the gathering hub, including the smithy which was absent in the base games gathering hub. I didn't even talk about the base games gathering hub because it's so worthless you're probably never going to even go there. As for the monsters themselves, there is an immediately noticeable spike in difficulty from the base game, but it hardly feels like too much of a jump by any means, it feels like just the right amount of difficulty increase for going into the DLC. It makes it feel like getting hit actually matters now, and maintaining consistent damage is far more important if you want to kill the monster in a relatively timely manner. Viper Kadachi was one of the more annoying early monsters in particular, since it has both poison and paralysis status effects, which can be super annoying to deal with in tandem with each other. Especially early into Iceborne, when you likely don't have any of the ideal decorations to counter build these status effects. Thankfully, the Viper Kadachi awards you with one of the greatest weapons for progression in Iceborne. I was using this weapon for at least half of my playthrough because it just did fantastic damage, and it also had a paralysis effect on it, which was incredibly useful. It wasn't until Baryoth, though, that Iceborne had its first major difficulty spike. This was the first monster in the game that really forced me to sit down and look at its moveset and analyze what it was doing to properly get the win against this damn guy. 
Now, obviously, in the footage you're seeing now, I have insanely powerful gear like full Fatalis. Obviously, this guy is no threat to me anymore. But man, when you first fight Baryoth, and all you've got is that damn fucking seasonal gear, whatever's available at the time, because it just is really good for some reason. And then, you know, you got your, like, Viper Kadachi weapon, and you gotta take on this damn Baryoth. He's so fast, he barely leaves any openings, and he feels super overwhelming to initially fight. This was the very first monster in the game that I actually lost to multiple times before I was able to beat him. Uh, and so I will never forget Baryoth for being the first major jump in this game that said, you need to fucking focus up and learn what this monster is doing if you want any chance of beating it. I also just want to say that it caught me by surprise that Baryoth was the monster to skill check me. You gotta understand, I played Monster Hunter Rise, and Baryoth in that game is a fucking joke, for all I remember. Like, I don't even remember fighting Baryoth in Monster Hunter Rise. He was just kind of forgettable and very easy to fight. So, it's very crazy coming to this game and being like, holy shit, Baryoth actually is like a difficult monster in Iceborne. From Baryoth and onwards though is when Iceborne really starts to hit its stride, and that's where Monster Hunter World became one of my favorite games that I've ever played. Something about this game, which I think is a very rare quality that not a lot of games manage to get right, is that feeling that it just keeps getting better and better and better with every single quest that you continue to unlock. It's not long after Baryoth that you'll be fighting one of my absolute favorite monsters design-wise, being Glavinous. This monster's tail is a fucking fire greatsword, and that's his primary means of swinging at you. It's so badass. I love trying to cut off his tail to obviously greatly weaken him while you're fighting him, and he's just such a, a fun fight, the way he so elegantly swings that tail at you. It's really badass. I fucking love this monster, and he's just so sick. Eventually, you'll get to face Velkana, the poster monster of Iceborne. This is one of my favorite fights in the entire game, especially the Arc-Tempered version you get at Master Rank 100. I absolutely love everything about this monster, from its music, to its design, to its moveset. I love how you get to break pieces of its ice off to weaken it. It's just such a fun fight, and it's an incredible matchup for my weapon, the Insect Glaive. It's really, really easy to pour out a lot of damage in this fight, because Volcana is not very good at hitting you out of the air, as opposed to a lot of other monsters in this game. On the topic of Elder Dragons, I also want to mention one of my favorite monsters in terms of design in all of Iceborne, being Namiel. This monster looks so, so cool. It's one of the most colorful monsters in the entire game. I love how it switches colors throughout the fight, depending on what elements it's using. And overall, it's just a fucking gorgeous monster within this game, and a unforgettable fight. I love the way that it wields both water and lightning. I feel like that's one of the best pairings of elements they could have come up with. It'll basically like put these water puddles on the ground, and then do big shock attacks that cover, you know, those puddles and make them unsafe. It's a very, very cool fight, and one of my favorite designs in the entire franchise at this point. I really, really hope this monster comes back in Monster Hunter Wilds. Eventually, the story culminates in this awesome double boss fight against Runer Nergigante and then Shara Ishvalda. Shara Ishvalda especially is a very notable fight within this game. There's nothing quite like it, so it's a shame that there's not a more difficult, like, arc-tempered version of this guy for the end game. Uh, you know, this one that you fight in the story is basically as difficult as it ever gets, which is a little bit of a shame because as you're seeing in this footage, right, with full Fatalis gear, you know, this monster's just a complete joke now. Anyways, what sets this fight apart from the rest is the fact that it's actually divided into two very distinct phases. The first of which, you'll have to break the rocks that are actually surrounding the boss. This is like a protective shell around its true body. You know, it's really cool because when you first get here in the story, it's like, wow, this fight's kind of really underwhelming. Like, this is the final boss? And then, you know, you finally break that shell off and you're like, oh shit, this is the final boss. And man, this second phase is fucking awesome. While it may not be the most difficult boss in the game or anything like that, it is such a spectacle fight, it has so many cool looking attacks. Whenever I see SOS flares up for this guy, I love joining them just to like fight this monster again. I think it's so damn cool. A really sweet touch they have on this boss is that its eyeballs, once they open, will actually track your camera and not your character, so it looks like the boss is staring into your soul while you're fighting it. I think this is a really, really cool touch given this boss is kind of Buddhist theming and stuff. And now it gives me a good opportunity to talk about cinematics as well since I guess before this there haven't been many that really stuck out to me enough to be worth mentioning. This cinematic is fucking badass, man. Runer Nergigante gets back up, flies on down, and fucks up Shara Ishvalda. 
It is such a badass cutscene, and it was like, damn, you know, this game forced me to watch a lot of mid cutscenes, but at least this one was badass. Now, at this point, if you couldn't already tell, I was completely in love with Monster Hunter World now, and I couldn't imagine how it would continue to get better from here, and yet somehow it does. Right after you defeat Shara Ishvalda and you complete Iceborne's main story, you'll actually gain access to these special assignments, which were basically added in title updates sometime after the game's initial release. These are effectively the continuation of the storyline, and a goddamn do they start off strong. Your first assignment is to investigate a Kirin with a broken horn spotted in the Horfrost Reach. You see, Kirin is an extremely powerful Elder Dragon, and the Horfrost Reach is not its natural habitat, so this was a very alarming sighting that we needed to go investigate, you know, what the hell destroyed this Kirin's horn. And this is what leads into the most badass monster introduction that I have ever seen in this entire goddamn franchise. Yeah, I had to let the cutscene do the talking on that one because goddamn, man, best cinematic in this entire fucking game. And I guess on that note, I really hope that in Monster Hunter Wilds, they continue with cinematics like this one, where there's a huge emphasis on watching these big-ass monsters beat the shit out of each other, because that is way, way, way more fun to watch than, you know, watching these characters talk about fucking, oh, we need to go hunt a this. You know, like, no one really cares. I want to see the monsters beat each other up because that's badass. In terms of the actual fight with Rajang as well, this is one of my favorite monsters to fight in this whole game. And man, you gotta consider, I came from Monster Hunter Rise, and while Rajang is still really cool in that game, he is severely nerfed compared to this version of him. World Rajang is so much more threatening because his speed is actually unique within this game, I suppose. Whereas in Rise, you know, you're still faster than him because that game's all about movement. It just, it really makes Rajang feel like a serious threat in this game with how fast he can be and how little openings he seems to leave when you're new to fighting him. In terms of monster design too, I just love this guy. He's, he's literally a Super Saiyan monkey. I don't think it gets any better than that, you know? Now, moving on, I want to skip over some of the other special assignments to talk about the one that left the biggest impact on me out of this entire game. I left this fight saying to myself, I love Monster Hunter World, and everyone needs to play this game. And that fight was Raging Bracky Dios. You see, I knew pretty much nothing about this monster before I unlocked him, other than the fact that he unlocked alongside Furious Rajang. So my assumption was that Raging Bracky was basically the Furious Rajang equivalent of a Bracky Dios, which, in a way, isn't too far off, but I definitely didn't understand how crazy this monster was going to end up being. My very, very first time in the fight, I was like, okay, yeah, I'll send an SOS flare. This fight seems pretty difficult, and we'll see how it goes. It didn't go well. Uh, we died in about, like, two minutes because all three of us got killed by the same attack, and I was just like, all right, man, I'm gonna solo this because that didn't go very well. And that was the best decision that I made in this whole game. Soloing this fight makes it so, so special, if you haven't reached this guy yet and you're watching this video, please, for the sake of your own experience, solo this boss. It will be the most tense, most heart-pounding experience you've ever had on this game. It's amazing. What makes this boss so scary when you're initially fighting him is the absurd amount of damage output he has with his blast procs alongside just how much damage his basic attacks do. If you get hit by an attack while you have his, like, blast debuff on you, you're just gonna blow up and die. It does that much damage, you know, especially when you just first get to the fight and you don't even have augmented gear or anything of this sort. I mean, I must have been, like, Master Rank 30 when I first fought this guy or something like that. Maybe Master Rank 40. Uh, so I had nowhere near the type of resources I would need to survive multiple hits from this guy. 
I was also hardly using the Clutch Claw at this point, which I haven't mentioned yet, but it's basically a very, very crucial mechanic added in Iceborne that you can use to make weak spots on the monster and hit the monster into walls to get knockdowns and stuff like that. It's an extremely powerful tool, and I basically didn't start using it until after this fight when I realized how powerful it was. I also didn't even know the Shaver Jewel existed, which makes you tenderize in less hits on your fast weapons. So if I did want to tenderize with Clutch Claw on the Insect Glaive, it would mean I'd have to do it twice on the same body part to actually make it a weak spot, which is incredibly tedious. So yeah. Even just approaching this boss felt so intimidating the first few times I fought him. Anything he could do would one-shot me. His explosive puddles he leaves on the ground give you a debuff if you stand in them, and then you need to roll like 20 fucking times to get rid of the debuff. It's like fire debuff on crack, you just have to keep rolling and rolling and rolling until it goes away, it's crazy. After an arduous 20 minutes with this boss and using two of my three lives, I finally pushed Raging Brachydeos into low HP where he retreats to his nest. And this was the point where this monster permanently etched itself into my memory. You see, most of the time when a monster retreats to its nest in this game, it will go to sleep and allow for you to either capture it or get some extra free damage like I mentioned earlier in this video. Raging Brachydeos is the only monster in this entire game who will instead lure you into his nest, close off all of the exits, and enter his final stand mode. At this point, he can no longer be trapped or captured. This is a final fight to the death between you and Raging Brachydeos. The music is absolutely amazing at this part of the fight as well. It's pretty much like nothing else I've heard in this game until you reach something like Safi Jiva or Fatalis. Like, the level of epicness in this fucking song is crazy, even by Monster Hunter standards. Thankfully, like, mechanically speaking, this is probably the easiest part of the fight. This is your victory lap, but the first time you're fighting him, if you've only got one life left in this part, there is nothing more tense in this entire game than trying not to, like, die to something in this phase when you don't even know what the fuck is happening. It, my heart was racing when I killed this monster for the first time, and I will never forget it for as long as I live. I absolutely fell in love with Monster Hunter after I killed Raging Bracky Diaz. This was the moment in which I realized that Monster Hunter World really is the best Monster Hunter game I've ever played. Unfortunately, it was after Raging Bracky that things got very grindy. You see, I had now at this point unlocked both Alatrion and Fatalis, the two ultimate final bosses of the game. But in order to adequately upgrade my armor to actually challenge them without getting one shot, I needed to reach Master Rank 100. For reference, I was about Master Rank 42 when I killed Raging Brachydeos and got his weapon. This is where I found myself most frustrated with Monster Hunter World due to the Guiding Lands and its progression system. I don't want to talk about it too much here since the video is already going to be very long, and I could simultaneously complain about and praise the Guiding Lands for hours on end. The short of it though is that it's a very cool concept ruined by piss poor execution in some regards. Basically, the core idea is that you need materials from monsters in the Guiding Lands to go and augment your equipment and basically upgrade them beyond their max level. This would be great if there was a constant stream of progression, but there isn't. Instead, to actually get the materials you need to augment a max rarity piece of armor or weapon, you need to fight tempered elder dragons that only spawn in max level Guiding Lands zones. Okay, so let's just go max out some zones and get to it, right? Well, unfortunately that would be far too simple, because in order to actually unlock max level zones, you need to first hit Master Rank 100 for some pointlessly arbitrary reason. Only after you have that magic number 100 next to your name are you allowed to feel a sense of progression in this game again. This is made even more stupid by the fact that you can queue for Fatalis and Alatrion at Master Rank 24, but they are scaled around having max augmented gear. The MR grind was absolutely miserable. I did the Zenogre Decoration event quest way more times than any sane person should ever run a singular quest in their life, so I could constantly farm decorations and master rank at the same time. Thankfully, all this mindlessly tedious master rank farming paid off in the form of the two greatest fights in this entire goddamn game. These are the fights that everyone has heard of. These are the fights that I had high expectations for due to how much people hyped them up. And guess what? These fights still exceeded those expectations. 
Let's start with Elatrion, since he's the first of the two that you're going to unlock, and he's arguably the more complicated of the two. Elatrion is an incredibly unique fight due to the fact that he's got kind of an MMO-style instant kill mechanic, not too dissimilar from the Behemoth collab fight from Final Fantasy XIV. Unlike Behemoth, though, this mechanic isn't quite as simple as just standing still and waiting for the mechanic to resolve. Instead, you need to come extra prepared for Elatrion with the corresponding elemental weapons. Basically, Elatrion will start in either fire or ice mode, and you'll want to use the opposite weapon of his element in order to deal good elemental damage to him. You need to deal enough elemental damage before he does his Eschaton Judgment attack in order for it to not instantly kill you. You'll know you do enough damage if he staggers and you get a dialogue line from the handler that says, like, you've suppressed his element or something. Additionally, before he does Eschaton's Judgment, you need to break his horn. If you don't, he's going to switch elements after the cast, and obviously if he does that, you're completely fucked. Like, if you bring an ice weapon and then he switches to ice, you're going to be doing no damage to him anymore, and then you're going to die to the next Eschaton Judgment. If you do successfully get the stagger before he does his supernova, then you are A-OK, -okay. it's not going to one-shot you, you have so much time to heal through the damage as long as you actually get that stagger. And actually, with full Fatalis gear, if you practice the timing enough, you can actually just max potion through a unnerfed Eschaton's Judgment and survive it without even meeting that elemental DPS check, but that's a whole other kind of story. Whether or not you like this kind of enrage-style MMO mechanic will likely make or break this fight for you. As an FF14 player myself, I fucking love this fight and everything about it. The music is fantastic, the damage checks keep things tense even during the easier segments of the fight, and the necessity of breaking his horn, it adds this extra layer of required focus so you know, you're actually hitting his head the whole time and not just any part of his body. Soloing this fight is also incredibly satisfying to learn, and my weapon, the Insect Glaive, has some pretty interesting unique tech in this fight with the Kinsect. You see, most weapons in the Elatrion fight actually need to sacrifice raw damage in favor of Elemental, so that they can obviously get that stagger and then not die to the one-shot mechanic. Insect Glaive is unique in the fact it can put an element onto the Kinsect instead of the weapon itself. This means you can still bring your Fatalis weapon, just put Ice or Fire on your Kinsect, depending on which Elatrion you're fighting, and boom, you can still get the Elemental Stagger just by playing aggressively enough with Downwards Thrust. I thought this was a really cool weapon-specific thing for this fight, and I had a lot of fun learning this one solo. And finally, that brings us to the penultimate conclusion to this game, and a love letter to everything that came before it, Fatalis. Not only is this the greatest boss fight in this game, but this is one of the greatest boss fights that I've gotten the pleasure of experiencing in all of gaming. And I still haven't even gotten a solo kill of this guy yet. In terms of actual fight design, Fatalis is almost the opposite of Elatrion in the sense that he is far more simple mechanically, yet significantly more difficult at the same time. Instead of forcing you to engage with any fight-specific mechanics, the arena instead has a ton of artillery around that you can use to your advantage. There's binders, there's cannons, and at the very end of the fight you'll be able to use the Dragonator to do huge damage to him. This monster also does an absolutely insane amount of damage, yet he never really feels unfair or bullshit. His attacks are telegraphed perfectly, and the more time you spend in the fight, the more satisfying it feels to dance with this dragon. Now that I have my full Fatalis gear, I'm basically just addicted to joining random SOS flares for this fight and Elatrion over and over again, because they are just so fun to fight, especially alongside random people. There are some really funny moments in here when you just find someone who's clearly never entered this fight in their entire life, and you just get to witness their experience with it. It's a great time. I honestly don't know what to say about Fatalis that hasn't already been said in a plethora of videos already made about him. This fight is very beloved for a reason, and I truly think this is one of the greatest boss fights ever conceived. This is one of the few times in the game that it intentionally feels like you are fighting a boss and not hunting a monster, and I really appreciate that in this specific fight. Fatalis and Elatrion are both very close together in being my number one fight in the game, and I can honestly change it up on ev any given day which one is my number one. I've yet to properly solo the guy yet, so that's absolutely going to be my next major goal, and then I'll really be able to have a full opinion on which fight is better in solo, which fight is better in multiplayer, etc. I already have his full gear set, and I've gotten incredibly comfortable with the fight just by playing with other people, so I don't think the solo is that far away. 
Overall, I absolutely love the difficulty spike that both Fatalis and Alatrion provide. There's quite literally nothing even close to these two fights. Even Raging Bracky Dios looks like a complete joke in comparison to them, and I was actually surprised at how easy Safi Jiva was since I did Fatalis before him. But yeah, that's been my experience with Monster Hunter World over the last 300 hours of playtime. This has quickly become one of my favorite games that I've ever played, and I absolutely love how fluid the combat begins to feel once it finally clicks with you. It really feels strange when you're like first getting into the game, and it feels like it feels about as clunky as Lords of the Fallen from like 2014 or whatever, but it finally clicks with you and you suddenly feel like you're playing Devil May Cry. It's strange. There is nothing quite like Monster Hunter World, and if you haven't played the game but you enjoyed listening to me and my experiences in this video, then this game gets an absolutely massive recommendation from me. I also double recommend it if you have friends to play with because playing with other people is so much fun in this game. All in all, I was definitely sleeping on Monster Hunter World, and I hope this video was able to wake up some other people who are also sleeping on this game. Anyways, drop a like on the video, but only if you did, and subscribe to the Big Blue Purple channel if you're not already. Also, let me know in the comments what your favorite weapon and monster is in Monster Hunter World. I would love to know. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.